Well, I had a miracle on the way coming to church tonight. I got every light green. <laughs> I, I don't live very close to the church, and to get every light green is a, is a rare, a rare experience. So I think the Lord wants me to preach tonight. I'm very happy that you're here. It's good to see all of you. And it has been kind of a yucky day, hasn't it? A yucky day in the neighborhood, but uh, not, not as yucky as some places. My daughter and her husband live in Duluth, Minnesota. 16 inches of snow this weekend. And it looks a lot worse. Looks just a whole lot worse. So uh, we, uh, we missed that. I'm so glad we did. You know, uh, when our young guys preach, they quite often want to show you pictures of their family, right? Uh, this idyllic life that they all live, these beautiful wives, these gorgeous, perfectly well-behaved children, uh, their beautiful homes. Well, I kind of like, like to follow suit and just let you know a little bit about my lifestyle and, and what my family uh, has looked like. So I, if you don't mind, if it's okay with you, I'd like to show you just a, just a, a very few pictures tonight. First of all, uh, we have a picture of my parents. Uh, <laughs> Dad uh, was Ozzy, and Mom's name was Harriet. I, I just think they're a wonderful, wonderful couple. I tell you, Dad had more sweaters than Mr. Rogers, and uh, it, it was all. It always just brought uh, a sense of warmth and reassurance when he would sit at the chair and uh, I know we don't we know more about it now we don't do it but he would smoke his pipe and it was just a very pleasant evening with dad and mom all right now let me show you my brother uh, he uh, happens to be my twin brother <laughs> my twin brother George uh, although it's we're not identical twins uh, and he was, he was always so jealous of me, George was. Okay, uh, let me show you my sister, Anne. Uh, that's Anne. Uh, we called her Annie. She's a great, great sister. Uh, and our dog, our dog. We had a dog. Yeah, wonderful dog, Lassie. Loved that dog. What a smart dog. What a smart dog he was. And uh, this is our, our family, uh, family car when I grew up. Uh, <laughs> Dad never did let me drive it, but I tell you, it was just a pleasure to be in it. It really, really was. Yeah, that was a nice car. And uh, our humble home, we have a picture of our house here as well. <laughs> uh, my, my room was in the back, and uh, where, uh, the view wasn't quite as nice, but it was, it was still very pleasant experience uh, growing up in that particular neighborhood. And then, of course, we have two children. You've maybe heard us talk about Shane and Shelly. First of all, my son Shane. I'd like for you to see Shane. Yeah. We keep, uh, I don't know, we, we keep saying, Shane, come back, Shane, but he just never does. He never does. And, and then we, uh, our daughter, Michelle, um, um, <laughs> We, we called her, we called her Shelly. Now, listen, it wasn't a perfect family. Well, Anne was, but uh, nobody else in the family was perfect. I just thought you should meet my family and thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> thank you and forgive me, okay. Well, I, uh, I, I, uh, my sermon's gonna be uh, short and sweet like my wife. And uh, I, I told several people that it was going to be short and sweet. Uh, I do that just to see what their reaction is. And it almost without exception, they said, oh, good, good. Uh, one brother said, I'm looking forward to a great sermon tonight. I said, well, it's going to be short and sweet. He said, yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. So it will be. It'll be a short and sweet sermon. Uh, but nevertheless, I think a very important sermon. Uh, I just want to share with you what the Lord laid on my heart. There's nothing uh, perhaps hermeneutically insightful, homiletically impressive. 
But I tell you what, I, I just felt led to share with you what the Lord very quickly put on my heart uh, in preparation for tonight. Here we are, December the 1st. Christmas is right around the corner. And whenever I read any part of the Christmas story, I feel like I'm walking through sacred chambers into the Holy of Holies. And our text tonight leads us into that sacred chamber, Luke chapter 2 and verse 13. I hope as you came in tonight, you received a little handout with some scriptural readings for the next seven days. All of those are Christmas-related texts from the various Gospels. And Pastor, I didn't know he was going to do what he did, and he didn't know I was going to do what I'm doing tonight by making those scriptures available to you. But uh, we're trying to produce a culture of contemplation, reflection, of a pondering heart. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight for these moments we have together. Luke chapter 2, verse 13. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, when the angels had left the shepherds, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary, Mary, pondered. She treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, a word association test. I know you love them. When I say Christmas, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Perhaps it's a childhood memory, or maybe it's shopping, or a trip to grandma's house. Perhaps decorations, maybe some that still need to be done. Presents, maybe some need to be purchased. Christmas programs, choirs, cookies, credit card payments. Or is it more in keeping with the biblical account? A glowing star and angels aglow. Wise men and Herod, a wicked man. Old Testament prophecies and New Testament prophesiers. Weeping and rejoicing a mother, and a manger. Well, Christmas has an almost endless array of nuances that intrigue us and invite us to explore more, to dig deeper, to see more clearly the handprints of God in the Christmas story, and they are everywhere. Matthew and Luke lead the way. Matthew, a Jew. Luke, a Gentile. And then John adds his fascinating otherworldly insights. And tonight I'd like to lead us into a hushed, reflective entry into this Christmas season. Plenty of time for scurrying about. Plenty of time for getting into step with the world's secular version of the season. But then again, maybe not. Perhaps we will taste the quiet, and it will satisfy. So let these moments of quiet reflection and holy contemplation be the source and center of our Christmas season. The world's way never satisfies. It leaves the empty heart 
feeling emptier. The quiet of Christmas is replaced with the chaos of Christmas. Giving is replaced with receiving, solitude with shopping. Peace is replaced with a pace that is hectic and empty. And next year, more of the same. We've turned Christmas into a carnival, a tragic comedy, a crass commercialism. It would be expected from the world, but to see it so fully adopted by the Christian is, is sad. It's a sad thing indeed. As if things could satisfy, but things don't last. The new soon becomes old, waiting to be replaced by the new again. The only thing that lasts and the only thing that matters is that baby lying in a manger. You know, it's hard to imagine Silent Night being written today. Few would be interested in writing it and perhaps fewer in reading it. Silence is something we fear, something we avoid at all costs. We are afraid of what we might hear. Silence, anything but silence. And my prayer is that this night, the first night of December, would, find, would lead us into the, into the wonder of it all, the wonder of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who has worked so patiently and persistently in man's history even when man had no heart to cooperate or even a clue that he was a part of the sovereign plan. The wonder of God's hand directing the affairs of mankind to a time, yes, the fullness of time, and to a place, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea. For out of you shall come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. I pray that somehow in this season we can enter Zacharias' temple and smell the incense and see the altar and hear the prayers of those who worship. That we can visit the quiet hills of the shepherds. That we can walk the silent streets of Bethlehem. That we can quietly and reverently approach a cave where lies a manger and a mother and a speechless husband who is now a father and a baby who is the light of the world. That we can imitate and emulate this loving mother as she ponders these things in her heart. I pray there will be more pondering and less partying more pondering and less purchasing, more pondering and less pettiness. Ponder. Well, ponder that word. When was the last time you used it? For me, it was honestly, probably last Christmas. It means to, to weigh and examine, to sift and study, to compare. Mary was a ponderer. Mary was a thoughtful woman. She was a, a deep thinker. She was a reflective soul. There was an intellectual participation in her pregnancy, in God's dealings with her in the Scriptures, and certainly in the divine revelation given to her by Gabriel and now in the report of the shepherd. Her heart was full. She treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. Oh, she had a lot to ponder, didn't she? While wow, there were the Scriptures themselves, and don't you know she rolled those over in her mind repeatedly, anxious to see the light, anxious to connect the dots, anxious to understand the story of which she was a prominent part. 
How many of those scriptures would she find herself fulfilling without any premeditation or effort on her part? Isaiah's scripture, a virgin shall conceive. Micah's, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah, out of you will come a ruler. Hosea's, out of Egypt, I called my son Jeremiah's, a voice is heard, weeping in great mourning. And in keeping with the oral, oral traditions among the prophets, even their return to Nazareth, for he will be called a Nazarene. And Mary pondered. And yes, the angel Gabriel had come to her, the same Gabriel who six months earlier had visited Zacharias. Zacharias, and he told him, he told Zacharias, who was an old geezer at the time, an old man, that he was going to have a son, a miracle, and that his son would be called John, and John would be the way preparer for the Messiah. And that same angel showed up again, this time at Mary's house, and Luke records it in that first chapter. The angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And the angel said, You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And Mary pondered these things. And then there was that unforgettable meeting with her relative. Some say it's her cousin, Elizabeth. Mary was pregnant, and she was all excited about it, and she hurried off to visit Elizabeth to tell her the good news. And Elizabeth had some good news of her own. She, too, was pregnant. With John, remember, the way preparer, John the Baptist, who was really more like an Assemblies of God preacher, based on what he preached. Well, he was. And when Mary entered Zach's and Liz's home, and Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in Elizabeth, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb and was filled with the Holy Spirit. I told you he was assemblies of God. And it says in a loud voice, Elizabeth exclaimed to Mary, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? These ladies had it going on. Their husbands have been pretty clueless, but what's new? But they have a keen spiritual insight. And Mary pondered these things. And now we come to our text. The shepherds. They've been out in their fields doing the shepherd thing, keeping watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. He's not identified. His name is not given, but I have to wonder, could it? Could it have been that same angel, Gabriel, who had visited Zacharias and Joseph and Mary? If so, he is one busy angel. He's sure making a lot of house calls. And the angel comes, and to Mary and to the shepherds he makes the Christmas pronouncement. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a son of David has been born. David's Lord has been born. 
a Savior has been born to you, who is Christ the Lord. And then, and that's when the choir showed up. Oh, yes, heaven has a choir. It has many, many choirs. Churches ought to have choirs, but that's another sermon. This angelic choir filled the sky with their song, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And then the shepherds hurried off to Bethlehem, and through their GPS systems, God prompting shepherds, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And they told them what they had seen and what they had heard. Oh, what a conversation. Wouldn't you like to have been able to listen in on that one? They're all trying to talk at the same time. Finally, one shoves his way to the front. He says, like man, there was this angel. He was glorious beyond words, and he told us about your baby boy and who he is and, and what he is. And, and then the sky was filled, filled with the sounds of angels singing. And we have come. We have come to see him for ourselves. This promised one, this long-awaited one, we have come to worship him. And to the words of the prophet, she added the words of Gabriel. And to the words of Gabriel, she added the words of Elizabeth. And to the words of Elizabeth, she added the words of the, of the shepherds. And Mary treasured up all these things, she gathered up every fragment, every word, every nuance, every inflection, every look and every eye, all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. I doubt very much that God would have visited and blessed and entrusted such a person with such a holy mission who didn't have a pondering heart, a heart that ran deep. Mary's deep and thoughtful disposition was the fertile womb that birthed a miracle. It was the key to her creativity. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons we, we don't do a lot of pondering, a lot of reasons, and maybe we don't even want to know or face those reasons. You know, I think of the church today, the church world, and how it carries on its business, and there seems to be few pondering hearts all too often we have become mimickers and copycats and empty echoes instead of voices, lamps without light. We, we lose our originality, our creativity. We grow accustomed to shallow sermons, anemic programs, and routine routines. And the church finds itself going through the motions without emotions. And it becomes utterly predictable, utterly boring. And how could it? How could it? No pondering means no passion and no purpose and no power. You ever walked into a church like that? The ushers look like Nazis. The worship leader overdosed on NyQuil. The preacher is in a coma. <laughs> They've worked hard, but they haven't pondered much. Because if you've really pondered, you've got something to say. If you've really pondered, you are on a mission. Expectancy will be in the air. God, give us pondering hearts. You see, pondering is hard work, but it must be priority work. It is essential if we will produce anything of value for the Lord. How about you? Are you so busy making a living that, that you've not really made much of a life? 
Are you caught in the trap of what C.S. Lewis called the barrenness of business? Are you so on the go that prayer and meditation and contemplation are gone? There's so much to be lost when we don't have a pondering heart, and there's so much to be gained when we do. If we've lost a pondering heart, we've lost our way. We've lost the secret place, the sacred place. We are a lamp without a light. Can I challenge you this Christmas to find the quiet place? Turn off the impeachment hearings, maybe even your phone, and sit and read and pray and contemplate and listen and ponder. Just you and God. Find yourself again. Find your God again. Now, in addition to what Pastor has encouraged you to read this week, I hope that you'll take these texts of the various gospel accounts of the Christmas story. And how about making this a week of pondering about the majesty and the miracle and the meaning of Christmas? There are seven biblical readings, one for each day of the week. And you say, well, you know, man, I've heard that Christmas story a hundred times. Well, maybe you have, but with a focused mind, a disciplined mind, and a pondering heart, it just never gets old. New truth will be discovered, and the Christ of Christmas will be seen in ways never seen before. You will meet Zacharias Most High. Gabriel's son of God and Elizabeth's Lord and Mary's baby and the shepherd's Christ, the Lord, and John's word who was in the beginning and who was with God and who was God. Now you will discover that you are just beginning to learn. That's the power and the promise of a pondering heart. Father, uh, we ask you to forgive us for falling prey to one of the easiest sins of life, for being so easily distracted and preoccupied with other matters. Forgive us for being too busy, sometimes with important matters, but sometimes not so much. And I thank you, Lord, for the mystery in the equation that as we pull away from that busyness and devote ourselves to you, our time to you, that somehow we never lose time. We, we always make up time. We gain time. And we're too busy not to pray. I pray, Lord, that, that we'll get, not get lost or mesmerized by the whirlwind of activity that so persistently beckons us, tempts us. But I pray that we will hear a higher calling and that our hearts will know how to ponder the things of God, the truths that really, really matter, the truths that enrich a soul and a life, the truths that make that life better for time and for eternity truths that will enhance and enrich our walk with you and our work for you. Father, I thank you for people that, that have a heart after God. I thank you for pastors that care about that. And I pray in this sweet and gentle season that in the rush, in the clamor, in the noise, we will hear your voice. And having heard it, it will make us hungry to hear it again and more and more. 
on this first day of this Christmas month. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. So great to see you tonight. Have a great week. Spend some time in his presence.